Okay, Mr. Speaker, uh, YouTube is rolling. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. I call the uh, Rules Committee to, uh, to order uh, on the, this session, June 3rd, 2020, and uh, recognize the clerk for a message. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Mr. Speaker, you have a uh, script that you are prepared to read. And um, uh, if, if so, would you please do that? Certainly. Thank you. As chair of the House Rules Committee, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, this public body is authorized to meet electronically. Please note that there is no physical location to observe and listen co contemporaneously to this meeting, which was authorized pursuant to the governor's emergency order. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are, A, providing public access to the meeting by telephone with additional access possibilities by video and other electronic means. We are utilizing Zoom for this uh, electronic meeting all members of the committee and select legislative staff have the ability to communicate contemporaneously during this meeting through this platform. The public has access to contemporaneously listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by clicking on the following website address, https colon backslash backslash zoom dot us backslash j backslash nine three Eight four nine three six eight seven zero nine, or dialing one of the following phone numbers: one three one two six two six six seven nine nine, or one nine two nine two zero five six zero nine nine. B, providing public notice of the necessary information for accessing accessing this meeting. We previously gave notice to the public of uh, the necess necess uh, of the necessity of necessary information for accessing this meeting, including how to access the meeting using Zoom or telephonically. This information is printed in the House calendar. C, providing a mechanism for the public to alert the public body during the meeting if there are any problems with access. If anybody has a problem, please call 271 36 Zero zero, or email at hcs at leg period state period nh period us d adjourning the meeting if the public is unable to access this meeting in the event the public is unable to access access this meeting the meeting will be adjourned and rescheduled. I want to introduce the staff that are on the meeting assisting us. Paul Smith, House Clerk, is the meeting host. Chris Conquest, Speaker's Executive Assistant. Additional House Committee Service staff providing support are Brad Greenland, Christina Dyer, Jen Four, and Pam Smiling. This is a public meeting of the Rules Committee. A copy of the agenda in minutes has been posted on the main page of the General Court website under the heading remote meetings, quote unquote. Please note that all votes that are taken during the meeting shall be done by a roll call vote. Let's start the meeting by taking a roll call attendance. When each member states their presence, please also state whether there is anyone in the room with you during this meeting, which is required under the right to know law. I now call on the clerk to take the committee attendance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, we did seem to lose uh, Representative Holzel. Um, I do see that there are some numbers um, on the uh, call-in line, and I'm not sure if one of those is her. Uh, if so, I would ask her to raise her hand uh, so she does. Um, uh, so she does um, notify us that it's her. So okay. <clears throat> uh, Shirtliff. I am at the uh, the speaker's office at the state house, and I am alone. Walner. You're muted. I'm sorry. 
I'm at my home in Concord, New Hampshire, and I am alone. Weber. I'm at my residence in Walpole, New Hampshire, and I am alone. Lay. I am at my residence in Jaffrey, New Hampshire, and I am alone. Ebel. I'm at my residence in New London, New Hampshire, and I'm alone. Butler. I'm at home in Hart's location, and I'm alone. Hinch. I am at my office in Merrimack, and I am alone. Packard. I'm in the uh, State House, and I am alone. Hosel. Do not see that she's raised her hand, Mr. Speaker, so I'm not sure if she is one of those callers or not. Uh, Baldessaro. I'm at my home in Londonderry and my wife is in and out. Okay. Mr. Speaker, we, uh, we do have a quorum of the committee uh, with nine of 10 members having answered the roll and uh, we are attempting um, to reach Representative Holzel. Okay, very good. Um, we'll continue with the first item on the agenda, which is the approval of the minutes of February 8, 2020. And while staff is attempting to contact uh, Representative Hosel and get her back online with us, is there a motion to approve the minutes of February uh, 18th? So move. Representative Baldessaro moves. Is there a second? I'll second. Representative Walner seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, I uh, will ask the clerk to call the roll on the acceptance of the minutes of February 18th, 2020. Hurtless. Yes. Walner. Yes. Weber. Representative Weber. Yes. Hey. Yes. Yes. Butler? Yes. Inch? Abstain, I wasn't present. Packard? Yes. Baldessaro? Yes. Motion carries eight to zero, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. The first item on our agenda for this morning is to discuss and approve amendment to House Rule 65, parentheses A, as uh, introduced by myself, Representative Shirtliff. At this time, I'm going to turn the gavel over to the Vice Chair, Representative Mary Jane Walner, um, for the, as we take up this bill for the purpose of my presentation as well as the vote. Um, and I ask the Chair for recognition to speak to my motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I recognize you for your motion. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Um, as we know, in this pandemic, the House went into recess um, in mid, um, mid March and have not been able to really uh, continue with our work in a timely manner. Right now, our rules required, uh, right now we are out of rules. We do not have rules to finish out the rest of this session. The amendment I'm offering is an amendment to uh, House Rule 65A. What the amendment would do would be to uh, have June 11, 2020 as the last day to act on all House bills. June 25th, 2020 would be the last day to report all Senate bills. And June 30th, 2020 would be the last day to act on all Senate bills and last day to concur on amended House bills. Uh, those are the rules that I would like to see this uh, committee uh, authorize me to uh, introduce and to uh, give approval to draft legislation. If there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, Madam uh, thank Vice you. Chair, Representative Hinch has his hand up. Representative Hinch. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'd like to be recognized for comments. Um, on Tuesday, March 17th, I received an email from the Speaker's Chief of Staff with details for your committee on legislative continuity. The duties of the committee were to investigate any necessary legislation, change in House rules, or possible constitutional amendment. The committee met once briefly over the phone. A subsequent meeting was canceled and no other meetings uh, of the continuity committee have occurred. We had a chance to meet, work on these issues, identify priorities, 
and build consensus within our respective caucuses based on the committee's bipartisan work. It appears as if the process was abandoned and you made decisions exclusively with your leadership team and told us what you decided to do or not do after those decisions had already been made. This was not how this was supposed to work. When Republicans supported the change to, to Rule 65B, it was with the understanding that you were acting in good faith and would include Republicans in this crisis response process. It was with the understand, that understanding that you would proactively seek Republican input to achieve the concurrence required in 65B. We have seen very little attempt at seeking Republican input via the continuity committee. And rather than work within the terms of 65B, we now see an end run around it by proposing this amendment 65A. Mr. Speaker, we have a number of concerns about the proposed schedule in your 65A amendment. It sets forth a very quick time frame for public hearings. We are not fully briefed on how these hearings will occur, but we can only assume at this point they will be remote. As we all know, the House held its first remote public hearing on a bill yesterday, and there were several concerns brought to my attention about its extended time to complete function and execution. How can we reliably administer dozens of these hearings in a short time frame? Republicans have a roadmap forward. We have a realistic and comprehensive set of dates for deadlines that we believe meets the needs of a thorough legislative process. We are not here to obstruct. We agree that the people's work needs to be addressed, but we are here to ensure the spirit of bipartisan cooperation. The spirit of 65B is not uh, pushed aside during this uh, pandemic. I think we all know where this is going, Mr. Speaker. Perhaps if the continuity committee meets sometime in the future, we can work these things out rather than be presented with an all or nothing vote on one party's proposed dates. Respectfully, Mr. Speaker, I will not be voting in support of the amendment 65A. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank, thank the leader you. for his message. Thank you, Representative Hench. Um, actually, uh, could I have a motion on the on these uh, proposed rules changes? Representative Ebel? So moved. Representative Ebel moves to accept the uh, rules changes. Is there a second? Representative Lay has his hands up, Madam Vice Chair. Okay, Representative Lay seconds. I second. Um, further discussion on um, the motion? Yes, Representative Lay. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I actually, I support the rules uh, change. Um, and I just wanted to offer some comments um, in response to my uh, colleagues' uh, comments. My understanding of the Legislative Continuity Committee uh, was that the Legislative Continuity Committee was to deal with long range issues involving uh, processes of the House, in particular, uh, things such as constitutional amendments, et cetera. Um, there was never any understanding uh, that the Legislative Continuity Committee was actually a committee to arrange bipartisan agreement on policy issues. That was not the intent of that committee. And actually in the letter that, um, or in the email that the, uh, my good friend just read, there's no mention of any sort of uh, uh, policy issues to be discussed nor was there on the floor of the House um, at the time, nor is there in Rule 65B. Having said that, um, there was con uh, consultation with um, members of, uh, of my good friend's uh, uh, party. Um, and I would just simply note that um, of, the fifth, of the 20 uh, policy committees that um, uh, I, I would consider here, two made no recommendations in terms of bills, but of the remaining uh, 18, uh, three committees, okay, did not, there did not seem to be much consultation, but that means in 15 of the 20 committees, there was consultation between the committee chair, committee vice chair, and the ranking member. And on eight of those committees, there was extensive uh, communication between the ranking member and the committee chair, so much so that the ranking member contributed to, in many cases, the completion and the development of the so-called priority bill list. So the notion that there's been no consultation is a false claim. 
also claim that there has been no communication between uh, the Democratic leadership and my friend's uh, leadership as well is also a false claim, I, would, I think, or at least a mistaken claim. I will say that. I, I take back. It is not a false claim. It is mistaken. Um, because I believe that there has been uh, repeated communication between the speaker um, and members of my good friend's leadership team. So to make these sorts of accusations and claims is simply uh, uh, an error, I believe, um, which I hope my friend will correct. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Lay. Um, further discussion? Uh, Representative Hinch. Thank you. Um, I would. Um, I don't want to get into a debate on this. That's not going to be productive at all for us. Um, but I would call uh, Representative Lay's attention to the exact verbiage um, of House Rule 65 that talks specifically about the deadlines listed below will be reasonably amended by the speaker with the concurrence of the Democratic and Republican leaders. We are here talking right now about deadlines, scheduling, and that's exactly what my um, remarks referred to. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hinch. Further discussion? Don't see Seeing any other hands, Madam Vice Chair. Okay. Seeing no further discussion, um, I will ask the clerk to call the roll. The motion is um, to accept the rules amendment as presented by Steve, by uh, uh, Representative Shirtliff. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, Walner. Yes. Weber. Yes. Lay. Yes. Ebel. Yes. Butler. Yes. Inch? No. Packard? No. Hosel? No. Baldessaro? No. Uh, the motion passes five to four. Uh, Mr. Mr. Clerk, just for the record, uh, is the person presenting the motion not entitled to speak? Uh, to vote, rather. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, as, as is your policy, when, when a member is presenting something before the committee um, and they are uh, the person presenting, they typically do not participate in the vote. Um, if, if you'd like to change that, we can, we can certainly... No, that's fine. I just wanted to put it on the record why. Could I... Representative uh, Weber seems to have a question. In our policy committees... My understanding is that that has never been the rule. Um, and I don't know of any policy committee that has operated that way. It has always been the procedure ever since I started here uh, that the committee chair stepped down from presiding That's when correct. they were presenting a bill and the vice chair or another member presided but no one has ever, to my knowledge, lost their vote for presenting a bill. And I think if we that, that is that Representative is Weber true, is correct, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think that's a very dangerous precedent. So I hope that we will not observe it now. And I hope we will not observe it going forward because it's a complete misstatement of what we've been doing. The, Representative Weber is, is correct, Mr. Speaker. I, I misspoke on the on that when we spoke yesterday, I, I was under the impression that you uh, were stepping aside from the vote. But uh, um, certainly, if you uh, want to vote, then by all means. Uh, I have not stated the, uh, the the vote total yet. So, um, would you? Uh, I'll pass on this vote, uh, Mr. Clerk. Uh, but any other future votes, uh, I think I'm introducing one of the motion, and I would yes, request sir. a vote on that one. And I thank the clerk and in uh, the. Uh, Speaker Pro Tem for the commentary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, Madam Vice Chair, the motion passed four. Motion passed um, five to four. Thank you, um, Mr. Clerk. And should we move on now to um, requests for late drafting and introduction? And Representative I, Baldessaro has his hand up. Representative Baldessaro. Thank you. I, I had a I, I actually uh, hit, I did it by the way we're supposed to. I hit the raise the hand. I had a question there. I'm a little confused on it. I know we already cut the vote, but 
But can somebody tell me why, I mean, my 14th, it's my 14th year, why all of a sudden no committee of conferences, why that was pushed aside? I know Dick Kintz explained it to the caucus and I had to get up when he was speaking at that, but I'd like to hear why all of a sudden we got rid of Oh, yeah. Um, shirtless, would you like to yeah. explain I, I why? Yeah, I would defer to Representative uh, Leader Hinch if he wants to explain to uh, the member what was said in their caucus, but I'd be glad to answer it as best I can. Um, as we know, we're trying to finish up our business in the New Hampshire House as well as the Senate by a normal deadline of June 30th uh, because of the pandemic. Um, we're trying to re reduce meetings as much as we can. I'm very proud in the New Hampshire House, we have had over a dozen committee meetings and have ex exact over 30 bills, but we all know the uh, tremendous um, workload it puts on our outstanding uh, House staff, as well as members uh, in an agreement with the uh, Senate president to expedite uh, the finishing of our business. Um, we are requesting that we not uh, enter into any committees or conference um, because of the pandemic and the emergency orders, which we are all operating under in an order for us to finish our, our session by the June 30th deadline. Um, that's the best I can do. And if the member has a follow-up, I'd be glad to answer it if I can. Yeah, I do have a follow-up. The reason why, uh, this virtual stuff, like I'll give you an example. Yesterday, we had veterans call in, but because they didn't get the calendar and they didn't have the information to uh, register, they couldn't speak. Now, if they were in a room, they could have put the gut up and filled out a card and submitted it. So then I had homeless veterans on the phone no way of raising their hand. Uh, then all of a sudden, near the end, they said, press star nine. But they already got aggravated and hung up. So this virtual thing, would, we're stepping on the private, on the citizen's right to speak because not everyone has email, nor anyone sees the calendar. And I'm hoping we can get this corrected. And that's why I was shocked about the community conferences also with the excuse that we're in a pandemic when People are meeting all over the place. They're meeting out in the streets. Why us as legislators are scared? Well, I th if I may, Madam Chair, yes. follow up. Um, yes. I thank the member for his comment. I sent an email this morning to the chair of the Child and Family Law recommending uh, Representative Long for the outstanding job he did in conducting uh, that committee uh, hearing yesterday, that public hearing. It's my understanding over 15 people had an opportunity to speak uh, in support of the bill that uh, Representative Baldessaro um, introduced, that being a late bill, uh, but uh, a bill that uh, member felt had merit and a reason for its lateness. Um, we are operating, uh, our uh, House staff is operating as is the legislature, the House itself, under our 91A, our, our right to know law, we are following our house rules as, uh, as far as I know, this is the first complaint that I've heard of anybody not being able to uh, interact with the committee uh, hearing. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sorry if members uh, did not, if individuals did not have an opportunity to speak. Every hearing that is done via a video link is also made available to the public via a, a telephonic link so they can uh, call in as well. Uh, this is posted in the calendar, the methodology to access the meeting. And uh, we recently sent out rules too as to members who wish to speak uh, what that procedure is, uh, but also keeping in mind the security of the link itself. So uh, if um, um, anybody from the public did not have a chance to speak, I would uh, extend an apology to my friend from London, Jerry, but uh, uh, everything that we have done, we have done under the rules of the House and under uh, RSA 91A. Thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Thank Speaker. And let's thank move on Vice now Chair. to- Madam Vice Chair, Representative Weber has her hand up. Mr. Speaker. Representative Weber. Uh, I think at this point, if you'd like to move on, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll just take my hand down, so. Yes, let's, let's move on to the late drafting. And the uh, first item up is uh, 
again, speaker Shirtliff, and I believe it's, um, <clears throat> you have the drafting of a constitutional amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair and members of the committee, for the record, my name is Steve Shirtliff, and I represent Merrimack District 11, which is Ward 1 of the City of Concord, the Village of Pennacook. And I come before the Rules Committee this morning to ask for the permission for introduction and late drafting of a constitutional amendment concurrent resolution, commonly referred to as the CACR. Uh, Madam Chair, I became the Speaker of the House on December 5th, 1918. Thank you, don't I, I feel like a 1918, mm -hmm. 2018. And uh, <laughs> at that, that time, right after the First World War, I uh, took over. Um, at that time, in all seriousness, Ms. Madam my Chair, I never thought I'd see the day when the New Hampshire House of Representatives would not be able to meet in their historic chambers, where we have been meeting since uh, 1819. And uh, on one occasion, as the New Hampshire House met at an alternative location, that was in 1864 when the New Hampshire House met at the Merrimack County Courthouse because the house itself was under major reno uh, renovations. But at that meeting, the house was very able to meet together um, under our constitutional amendment, part two, article 20 of the New Hampshire constitution, members of the New Hampshire house are required to be present in the chamber to vote. Uh, we are working very extensively now to uh, hold a session on June 11th at the Whittemore Center at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, people can only imagine the logistics involved in getting 400 members of the New Hampshire House in one chamber, make sure that they are distanced and all efforts are made to maintain and protect their health safety and public welfare. In 19, on December 7, 1941, the New Hampshire, uh, New H United States was attacked at uh, Pearl Harbor. And the following day, the United States declared war on Japan and on the Axis powers. As a result of that, the New Hampshire legislature passed uh, an amendment to Article 5 of the New Hampshire Constitution, and that is titled Continuity of Government in Case of Enemy Attack. In this article of the New Hampshire uh, Constitution, we have the ability to meet at a different location and meet remotely in the event, uh, as the article says, uh, resulting from disasters and caused by an enemy, uh, enemy attack. Um, now realizing how important it is, primarily for the health and welfare of members of the New Hampshire House, uh, that uh, we do need a mechanism to allow the New Hampshire House to meet uh, online in remotely at remote locations. Um, I introduce this amendment to Article 5-A. Um, in consultation with the clerk and with the uh, counsel for the House, uh, it has been realized that the simplest thing for us to do in this Article 5-A uh, constitutional amendment to strike out the words resulting from disasters caused by enemy attacks. What this would do would be allow the New Hampshire House when, it, when we are in a national emergency or in a statewide emergency declared by either the president, president or the governor respectively to meet remotely and to uh, not be present at a meeting like we will be doing in, in Durham on the 11th. So, um, Madam Chair, I, if the committee has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. Again, this bill is filed late because uh, just a matter of a few months ago, we never thought there would be a need for the New Hampshire House of Representative to meet remotely and not be together in Representatives Hall. And I ask the, uh, the committee to support this uh, late drafting. And I'd be glad to answer any questions. I think I see Representative Hinch has his hand up. Am I right? You are. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and I thank the speaker for his um, um, presentation on this. Uh, for the record, um, I just want to state uh, this may or may not be um, a good 
um, amendment uh, to the Constitution? I don't know. Um, I understand the genesis of why this is coming forward. I, I have to, for the record though, um, make sure that I uh, am clear in saying that whenever we make uh, an amendment to the Constitution, it should be done um, with a, a very, very vigorous vetting. Um, and um, as we talked about yesterday, Mr. Speaker, with the business taxes that you're not going to support, um, the, this amendment coming forward is going to be uh, expedited through, rushed through, without uh, a good, thorough public hearing. The Constitution is one of the most, if not the most, uh, uh, critical documents that we have in front of us and to expedite a process just to make it to the November ballot uh, may not be <coughs> a wise um, uh, road for us to travel. Um, I haven't made uh, a decision whether I will support this on the floor or not. I just want to let you know that I have grave concerns about bringing this forward in an expedited fashion and not allowing a uh, good, thorough public uh, and private input into the cause and effect of this. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? Do we have a motion? Representative, Representative um, Weber? I move the adoption of the CAC, uh, the, the uh, motion. I move the approval of late drafting for the uh, motion. For the I'll CAC. second the motion. I'll second the motion. Weber moves and Representative Evil seconds the motion of uh, allowing for late drafting. Further discussion on the motion? Seeing none, do we have anyone on the phone that? Paul, uh, anyone else, we, else on the phone? Uh, Madam Vice Chair, the, the committee um, is, is uh, everybody's lined up here. There, the, the only folks here, there are several folks that are on the phone, but we typically don't invite yeah. public testimony for, okay. Um, okay. for like, drafting. Right, okay. Um, okay, so I will ask the clerk to call the roll. Yes. Walner? Yes. Weber? Yes. Lay? Yes. Ebel? Yes. Butler? Yes. Hinch? No. Packard? No. Ogle? No. Baldessaro? No. Yeah. Okay, the motion uh, to, for late drafting and introduction of a CACR is approved by a vote of six to four. And Mr. Speaker, uh, um, uh, Mr. Alaconis from the Office of Legislative Services is online, um, and we can touch base with him later in the day for um, that late drafting. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. And Thank you. Motion passes. I'll, I'm going to give knowledge. you back the gavel. Okay. It's always sure. a tough, get, tough act following the member from Concord, Representative Walner. She has done such an excellent job, um, and I thank her for filling in now. Um, we're still... Uh, hearing request for late drafting and introduction, the chair uh, recognizes Representative Hinch for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Speaker and members of the committee. Uh, the proposal I would like the committee to consider today is a simple but incredibly me meaningful step to address our economic recovery. New Hampshire businesses of all sizes are facing unprecedented losses as a result of the current public health crisis. We have the ability to ease the future burden uh, on our state's job creators by addressing the business tax rate triggers in current law. According to reports from the Department of Revenue Administration, over 40,000 business entities in New Hampshire pay one or both of our state's business taxes. Between 30 and 40,000 businesses pay the business enterprise tax which comes uh, even if they are not profitable. If we do nothing and the trigger is activated, the BET rate will rise by 12.5% on January 1st as a tax on, on business payrolls. And if our goal to get 
people back to work, it is critical that we alleviate uh, this future burden. Now I've read the news and I've heard it direct from the speaker and the majority leader that they believe this is not urgent and can wait until 2021. My message is that we cannot wait. Our businesses cannot wait. The rate uh, is scheduled to change on January 1st, well before legislation could be fast-tracked through the House and Senate. Businesses are making decisions now and will be through the rest of the year based on the prospect of that rate change. This affects their hiring decisions this year. This affects their ability to purchase capital equipment this year, et cetera. To ask businesses to wait and see, quote unquote, if the legislature does something in six months does not seem to make sense. The January rate tax rate is already affecting their decision making now, not allowing this simple modification to have an up or down vote by the House is the same thing as, as saying you are okay with increased taxes on our struggling small businesses during a global pandemic and economic recovery. This is not a dramatic change in policy. This would simply keep the rates where they are now into the new year. This is not rocket science. It's a way to demonstrate that the legislature is focused on jobs and the economy and we wanna help our small businesses rise out of this pandemic. The time is now to act on this urgent need for our businesses to know their taxes will not go up and they can get our citizens back to work. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there any uh, questions for Leader Hinch or any comments on the proposed uh, motion? Representative Baldessaro has his hand up, Mr. Speaker. The chair recognizes Representative Baldessaro. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I have to concur with uh, Representative Dick Hinch. And the reason why, I have a, a long time friend here, has been in business in Londonderry for about 10 years, okay? And they're not opening their doors anymore. I was told yesterday that we have some businesses on 102, there's moving trucks over there, packing their up, packing them up. They can't, they can't, they can't sustain the business anymore. They're closing down. This, I, this, I'm in Londonderry, you know, a well-to-do town. This must be happening all over the state. By if we don't take the extra step now and stop this so they can plan their budgets for January, we got problems. Uh, we're going to have a lot of bankruptcies in the state of New Hampshire. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. Any further comments or questions? Mr. Speaker, Representative Walner has her hand up. Representative Walden is recognized. Oh, she's muted. Unmute her. I'm sorry. Unmute. Okay. Can yeah. you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that. You're recognized. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. When I think about the late drafting, I always try to consider whether or not uh, the drafting uh, pertains to information that is completely new to the situation. And, and actually the triggers have been in the budget since we passed it in September. So we were all, we've all been aware of the, um, the triggers that were in the budget and how those triggers work. We're now in um, June. So we've had a lot of time to think about them and to have uh, brought forth in the regular um, session, we could have brought forth legislation to have changed those, those triggers. So um, for me, it does not feel like um, this is the time for us to be changing um, what we voted on in the budget in September. And um, as all of you know, the governor has um, allowed businesses to pay taxes that were due in April, they will be in, um, the date has been uh, pushed up to June 15th, which was a, I think a good, a good, good choice to push that date up. Um, but at this point, we don't really have the kind of information we need to make this kind of a decision. So uh, for me, I'll be voting no on the motion um, for uh, late drafting. 
Thank you. Mr. Speaker, Representative Hinch had his hand up and then Representative Hosel. Representative Hinch is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to remind everybody that is participating here today that the pandemic occurred uh, during uh, the month of March, um, and this is urgent and compelling at this time, was unforeseen at the time that the budget was negotiated and passed and put into law. So this is, this is something to address the pandemic and to help the businesses that are suffering and going out of business. This is not something that could have been foreseen back in December um, or earlier when we did the budget. Thank you. Representative Holzel is recognized. Thank you. Uh, I guess I would repeat exactly what Representative Hinch just said, but also I'm from a community that the business, all of the businesses are struggling at this point. And I've heard from many of them, I cannot vote uh, in favor of this. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Representative Lay, Mr. Speaker. Representative Lay is recognized. I think Representative Weber had her hand up before me. Uh, actually, you did because you went to the top of the list. Oh, <laughs> okay. What um, a gentleman. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I would just point out that um, uh, while the pandemic began in March, um, this trigger was put in place in September, and it was certainly understood by everybody, including the governor who proposed the trigger. Um, it was certainly understood that the only way this trigger would come into effect would be in um, uh, serious circumstances. Um, those circumstances have arisen. So therefore, there is nothing new here, um, except that it has actually has come to pass. So I don't see anything new um, that is developed here. Um, more to the point um, in what I did state the other day, uh, Right now, we do not know what the state's revenues will be for the fiscal year. Uh, we also don't know what the business tax revenues will be for the fiscal year. And this will be determined as stated in the budget agreement, um, ultimately by the, the CAFR, uh, which comes out in December of 2020. At that point, we would have much more information in terms of the overall status of state budgetary revenues, and we would also have much more information, obviously, upon the state of business tax revenues. And I think that on something such as this, uh, because it'll have a major impact on the second year, second fiscal year of the biennium, and also on future budgets and future bienniums, that it simply makes sense to wait until we have the full information at hand. Right now, we do not have it. Um, and so to make fiscal policy without adequate fiscal and financial information is akin to planning on the back of a napkin. And we should not be engaging in that sort of planning and that sort of policy making. Therefore, um, I must uh, vote against the proposal offered by my friend, Representative Hinch. Thank you. Thank you. Rep Representative Weber, Mr. Speaker. Representative Weber is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, much of what I was going to say has already been stated by Representative Lay, so I won't restate it except to say that although we did not anticipate a pandemic, this particular uh, catastrophe, we certainly did and have for years when we've been discussing triggers rec recognized that one of the things that might happen is a significant economic disruption and that's what we're looking at now. I also want to make it clear from my perspective that um, I absolutely agree that we have many, many businesses that are in terrible dire straits. Uh, but I think it very unlikely that for those businesses in dire straits, that the change in the business tax rates that we are talking about here is going to make a material difference to whether they stay open or not, because there are so many other stressors that are so much more dire for those businesses. 
And I also want to remind all of us that there are any number of very large out of state. Do I need to stop, sir? Uh, just just for a moment, I'm not sure why the recording was stopped. We're all set. Okay, good. Uh, my last point was just that we have many large out of state corporations who as a result of this pandemic are doing far better than they have ever done before. And as Representative Lay said, it is important for us to understand exactly who is benefiting and who is, uh, who is going to actually be affected in their business plans by the rate change. So I thank you very much for the opportunity to comment. Mr. Speaker, Representative Holzel has her hand up again. Representative Holzel is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I I misspoke, and because I didn't know exactly what the uh, uh, motion would be, but I am fully in favor of this motion, and I think it will help the little business, and we need to keep them around. Thank you. I thank the member for the correction. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Speaker, Representative Hinch had his hand up and then Representative Butler. And I would just make a quick mo uh, mention, Mr. Speaker, uh, one of the members accidentally hit um, on their computer or tablet the um, pause recording button and that's uh, what caused the interruption. So, so please just be mindful of... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> no comment. Um, uh, Re Representative... Uh... I'm sorry, Mr. Clerk. Uh, I know Representative Butler, but you mentioned a name it was before. Representative Hinch uh, had his yeah. and then Representative. That's Butler. what I thought. Representative Hinch is recognized. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And not, I won't pr prolong this because I know where the vote's going to go. Um, but in um, conclusion, I would just like to point out that this, this proposal is absolutely not being done on the back of a napkin. But failure to act on this will be on the backs of the businesses that will definitely go out of business from our lack of action on this. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rep Representative Butler is recognized. As a small business owner, I just want to reinforce uh, what uh, especially Representative Weber said, um, the impact of uh, this uh, tax uh, uh, will be minimal uh, if felt at all by my business and many other small businesses and having all of the information necessary uh, to understand the impact I think is critically important. And so therefore um, I will not be supporting the motion. Um, are there any other questions or comments? We currently don't have a motion before us. Is there a motion? on Representative Hinch's request. It's like Representative Baldessaro. Yeah, I'd like to make a motion that we support Representative Dick Hinch's um, request. Representative Baldessaro moves to we uh, accept the request for the late drafting and introduction. Is that seconded? Uh, Representative Packard is muted, but he's moving his mouth. Let me unmute him. <laughs> okay. I second it. Okay. Um, the motion is seconded. The motion before the house is the um, is the adoption of the request by Representative Hinch for the late drafting and introduction of this bill dealing with business taxes. Uh, are we ready for the question? Um, are there any other comment? Seeing none, I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Kurt Liff? No. Walner? No. Weber? No. Lay? No. Ebel? No. Butler? No. Hinch? Yes. Packard? Yes. Hosel? Yes. Balasaro? Yes. The uh, motion fails four to six. 
The motion has failed. The motion ought to pass is fails four to six. Is there another motion? I'll, I'll move in expedient to move forward with this. Is I'll that second. seconded? I'll second. Representative Weber moves, Representative Walner seconds the motion that the request is inexpedient to legislate. Uh, is there any comment? Seeing none, I ask the clerk to call the roll. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the question is to not allow for late drafting and introduction. Um, Shirtliff? Yes. Walner? Yes. Uh, Weber? Yes. Lay? Yes. Evil? Yes. Butler? Yes. Hinch? No. Packard? No. Ozil? No. Baldessaro? No. The motion to uh, not introduce um, and allow for late drafting is um, adopted six to four, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Just for the edification of those at home, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, the member does have the right to bring that request before the full House on the introduction of his bill. Uh, yes, yes, Speaker. On on the floor of the House, uh, Representative Hinch or any other member could move um, for uh, the suspension of rules suspension. for late drafting, introduction, uh, referral from committee, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I thank the clerk. Just for those that are watching, they'll know what the process is. Mr. Speaker, uh -huh. Representative Hinch has his hand up. Representative Hinch is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just so no one's surprised, um, I will be breaking, bringing a motion forward to the floor. I guess nobody's surprised. <laughs> okay. I thank the leader. I thank the leader for his comments. Um, right, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I'm going to move Representative Prout um, up from the attendee yeah. to uh, the panel for his uh, request. Okay, the last business before the committee, uh, other than other business, is a request by Representative Andrew Prout to bring in a late uh, a request for a late drafting and introduction of a bill. And Representative Prout is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am Representative Andrew Prout. Rep Sorry. Oh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am Representative Andrew Prout, representing Hillsborough uh, County, District Number 37, the towns of Hudson and Pelham. Back in March, I coordinated the issuance of a press release by a bipartisan group of legislators calling on the governor to temporarily allow bars and restaurants to be allowed to fill growlers during the state of emergency. Growlers are a refillable beer container, usually made of glass, and are very common in the craft brewing industry. They are refilled from beer taps very similar to pouring a pint for immediate consumption but are then sealed and transported. The filling of growlers at breweries has continued unaffected throughout the shutdown. This request was made in the hopes that to solve a looming problem. Draft beer in kegs has a very short shelf life. Unlike bottle or canned beer, domestic keg beer is mostly unpasteurized. The problem identified back in March is that if the restaurant shutdown lasted any significant period of time, the beer and kegs already in restaurant inventory would spoil. In this press release, I promised to do whatever I could to prevent this, including late introduction into the current term. And so here we are. Unfortunately, it's been a while since March. The beer in inventory back then has spoiled by now. I've heard from one restaurant owner of five-figure losses from spoiled beer, and that's even before disposal fees. Spoiled beer cannot simply be poured down the drain in such volumes without negatively affecting septic systems or sewage treatment plants. So the disposal itself has become a challenge as well. However, I still want to file the bill. While I sincerely hope it does not happen, many experts are concerned about a seasonal resurgence of the COVID-19 virus in the fall. If that happens, I want allowances to be in place for restaurants to be allowed to sell their existing inventory of keg beer if there's a new shutdown order or on in-person dining. The language I envisioned for this bill would do two things. Permit filling of growers with labels not matching the product within them. This is currently prohibited as a misbranding of beer. However, this is not a major concern in this context. The growler owner, the growler is owned by the consumer. They bring it in and request it to be filled with a specific product on the spot. The selling of pre-filled growlers is just not done. Additionally, most establishments are pre prepared to affix a temporary label or tag on, during each fill. 
And the second thing is permit on-premise license holders facing a shutdown or significant drop in volume due to a state of emergency to sell their existing inventory of keg beer in refillable containers under the same regulations as breweries. These two points go hand in hand as most breweries sell separately empty growlers with their brand logo. I cannot expect restaurants to do the same just in case of a shutdown. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd be happy to take any of the committee's questions. I thank the member. Are there any questions for Representative Prout or any comments? Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker, Representative Hinch had his hand up and Representative Baldessaro has his hand up. Representative Hinch is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I just want to, for the record, indicate that I'm in support, full support um, of the uh, late drafting uh, that uh, Representative Prout is bringing forward. I thank the member. Representative Baldessaro is rec uh, recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, for Andrew, uh, Representative Prout, I seen pictures of a uh, bar owner in Manchester and Concord with over ten thousand dollars worth of uh, kegs that have been outdated and couldn't sell. Have you seen many other restaurants with the same issue uh, with this beer that they had to get rid of? Or I don't know how they dispose of it um, throughout the state. Uh, I have been hearing uh, throughout the state and throughout the country of other restaurants with similar issues and trying to find creative ways to dispose of it, to turn it in, uh, to reprocess it into animal feed or hand sanitizer or do something with it. Uh, like I said, it's uh, actually quite a challenge to dispose of it in that volume without, uh, you know, environmental or other uh, effects on the existing uh, disposal options. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Speaker, uh, Representative Butler has his hand up. Chair recognize Representative Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Prout, uh, help me to understand um, the uh, the how this bill would proceed um, and whether or not it is just for the uh, pandemic and the emergency order. Um, I guess that's my first question. Will this only be during the period of the uh, emergency order? So the language I envisioned, uh, point one of permitting the growlers to be filled contrary to their uh, the printed logo on them, that I had envisioned just being a permanent thing because it's uh, it hasn't been something that has made a whole lot of sense because as I said, the growler is normally owned by the consumer. They walk into a brewery currently and request it to be filled with a specific product. The fact that it's prohibited under our current law for, as a misbranding to protect consumers, the Consumer Protection Act hasn't made a whole lot of sense to uh, anyone who's looked at it that I've spoken to. Uh, the second point would only be during a state of emergency that either does a complete shutdown or significant reduction in volume to the, uh, the sale of beer and so that they could sell it in an alternative manner in Growlers. And Representative Butler, do you have a follow-up question? I do, thank you. Um, Relative to the labeling issue, um, as you know, uh, the Commerce Committees, uh, at least in the House, deal with the um, uh, issue of our uh, alcohol bills and uh, statutes. And we have looked at and dealt with growler issues uh, over the past few years. Um, and the House indeed has supported uh, the use of growlers and extension of growlers um, in ways that uh, uh, will be consistent with how the uh, Liquor Commission um, is uh, willing and able to support it. So I'm concerned about the labeling issue. Um, and uh, I would want to see that uh, come before uh, the legislative body and to determine how to deal with that rather than uh, make a decision relative uh, to that piece. Um, uh, with a late drafting bill that hasn't had a chance to really um, be vetted. Um, so that concerns me. The rest of the bill seems to make sense. Representative Prout, did you wish to comment? Um, certainly, uh, I mean, I was trying to be the most expedient. If it uh, would uh, make the committee more favorable to bill, I certainly could add, attach the state of emergency language to that aspect of uh, the, the point number one in, in what I was proposing as well. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Further Lane. questions? 
I'm Representative, sorry, Representative Lee. Lee and Representative Baldessaro have their hands up, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Representative Lee is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I just had a, uh, actually two questions, one for the representative and one for the, uh, the chair, for the speaker. Uh, representative Prout, I, I think if I heard you correctly, you said this would take effect or this is to be effective in a state of emergency. And then I, I thought I heard you say, or at a time when there is a significant reduction in the sale of beer. I'm just trying to, I, I may have misheard you on that. I'm just trying to clarify for myself here. What, when, what would be the circumstances that you envisioned that this would take effect um, or that this would be in effect? Two, cri it, two criteria. The criteria okay. one is that this, there's a state of emergency and criteria two, that that state of emergency has either caused a complete closure or a okay. significant reduction of volume. Okay, so the reduction in volume um, in your uh, proposal would be due to the state of emergency, not just to, for Correct. example, the, the fact that people just don't want to drink X brand any longer and just don't feel like buying it. Correct. What, what I'm thinking here is if restaurants are open for 25% of normal capacity, clearly they won't be able to sell the same volume of beer. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then, Mr. Speaker, um, under the current rules as they stand, could the House consider an act on this bill? Um, given it that could. the current rules state that um, all House bills need to be acted on by, I think, uh, uh, well, second committee bills needed to be acted on by uh, a date set in March. Well, that's somewhat of a catch-22. Let me uh, ask uh, the clerk, um, Mr. Clerk, if we do not have a deadlines in place, would this uh, be brought in as a late bill? The, the short answer is, is yes, Mr. Speaker. Uh, similar to your CACR um, right. situation is that uh, you, your, um, your committee today can allow for late drafting and introduction only. It cannot supersede um, the other rules of the House. So in order to act on them when the full House comes together, it would still require two-thirds suspension um, for all of the other rules regarding public hearings, referral mm -hmm. Committee, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but um, it's that is still possible um, yeah. under under those scenarios. Uh, we can, um, you know, we could when the House comes together on the 11th, um, take up every piece of legislation with a two thirds suspension minus um, uh, deadlines to do that. Yeah. Just a, brief, a brief follow up, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Sure, uh, so if for example, on this bill, um, the House voted by a two-thirds margin to suspend the rules to allow them. Hang I haven't touched a, a thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, so if um, the House were to take up this bill, vote to suspend rules to take up this bill, does the bill need to pass by a two-thirds vote, or is it a simple majority then? So, so if we suspend all rules uh, regarding um, everything to get to this point, um, yep. then no, it would not require two thirds. Okay, uh, thank you. It would it would simply require a majority um, having suspended all um, relevant rules. Okay, thank you. Further questions or comments? Uh, Representative Baldassaro and Representative Butler have their hands up, Mr. Speaker. Representative Baldassaro is recognized. Uh, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Mr. Speaker, this bill here coming forward is a win-win. It goes in accordance with the rules committee there because who knew we were going to have a pandemic? The growlers that he talks about will help the many, many breweries throughout the state because this is attracting our young back to our state as we've been, our numbers have been going up. I heard earlier somebody say that it, wasn't, it would not be properly vetted but it's okay to not properly vet this bill, but the Constitution Amendment is okay, no big deal. So I'm hoping that we come together and, you know, let's support this and move forward and let the, let the representatives speak for it. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Butler. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, understanding that the uh, labeling piece of the bill will be um, within the executive order uh, period, um, I will uh, support the late drafting. 
Okay. Any other questions or comments? Is there a motion? Representative Baldessaro has his hand up and Representative Hinch has his hand up. We support the uh, late drafting of Representative Proud's bill. Representative Baldessaro moves the late, uh, the approval of the late drafting of Representative Proud's bill and Representative Hinch. Second. The motion is seconded. The question before the committee now is the motion to accept the late uh, drafting of Representative Proud's bill dealing with growlers. Are you ready for the question? Any other comments? Seeing none, I would ask the clerk to call the roll. Dirtless. Yes. Walner. Yes. Weber. Yes. Lay. Yes. Ebel. Yes. Butler. Yes. Hinch. Yes. Packard. Yes. Ozel. Yes. Baldessar. Yes. Motion passes 10 to zero, Mr. Speaker. And if I may, uh, Representative Prouts, um, if you could please email today um, that ask OLS at leg.state.nh.us email address with your information so that we can get it printed as uh, fast as possible. I'll do that. And thank you to the committee for your approval. Thank you, Representative Prout. And uh, with a vote of 10 to nothing, it's good to see that bipartisanship is alive and well in the New Hampshire House. And so uh, we'll now, now move on to other business. By the speaker of beer. <laughs> I want a growler. Um, <laughs> are there any other business to come before this committee? Seeing none, the committee will be in recess to the call of the chair. Mr. Clerk, do you have any additional uh, final comments? Uh, no, sir. Uh, thank you all for your, your hard work today. Thank you. And again, I want to thank uh, our house staff who have done such a marvelous job of putting this committee meeting together. And, and, and as always, I thank the clerk and thank all of you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.